Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So, One of the things I feel on Easter is that it's got to be awesome. (laughs) Um, There's different traditions of the church who think like Easter is this pinnacle of the year when we're we're, um, remembering this resurrection day when Christ rose from the dead. And there's other traditions in the church that say, no, no, don't treat any one Sunday as more important than another because it minimizes the rest of them. And there's something to be said for either tendency of the heart, but I got to say, like, I feel like it's Easter. Like, it's Easter. Um, it better be awesome. And I want you to know that, like, I cannot live up to that. Uh, I don't know if any of you feel that. I, I can't. And I think because what, what I associate with that, I don't know about you, but what I associate with that is an emotional high of sorts, which can be helpful, right? But the thing is about emotional highs is um, they're nice, but if you put too much into them, you chase them wherever you can find them. You know what I mean? Um, I I heard a a professor, I think it was Kent Hughes, if any of you know the writer and pastor and professor Kent Hughes, who said, um, I could tell you a story about really wonderful moments I've had with my dog about how like we were together for a really long time and I owned him for 15 years and you know my dog was with me in really tough moments and then you know sadly he died and uh, I could tell you all these beautiful moments about me and my dog and I could probably even make you cry but at the end of that story I will have told you about my dog So let's just say there's something, and that's nice to hear about a dog. There's something, though, that is is more sturdy than that emotional high, as wonderful as it can be. And it's what Christians believe is the truth. A truth that changed everything, that changed the universe. It's not too small of a a sentence. It's not not a, a truth about... Uh, personal meaning in hearts, or even about relationships that are kindled when we think about new life and beauty um, and even hope after death in the abstract or something like that. It's something that did nothing less than change the universe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Christians have always believed. It's the faith 
that formed the scriptures um, in every word in them. Um, and my job this morning is to help us understand that truth, first of all. To understand the truth, like that universal truth, that general, the facts, the truth of what happened at Easter, and also, not just grasp it, understanding it, but also to, to respond to that truth. So where that truth, that universal, those facts meet the personal, that's what we're doing this morning. And you can say you're doing that every Sunday, in any sermon. It's worth noting that that idea that maybe we're doing every Sunday, we're definitely going to try to do today, bring those facts, that truth, to personal experience. This is actually a good definition of wisdom as the scriptures describe wisdom. Wisdom is aligning our lives with the truth. I'll give you a few examples. According to, according to our scriptures, particularly the book of Proverbs, some of the Psalms, the wisdom literature of scripture. If I'm holding a sharp object like, like scissors, um, I need to align my reality with the fact that if I'm running while I hold a sharp object and I trip, it's not going to be a soft landing. That's wisdom at work. It's embodied. It's know-how. It's knowledge. But it's also filtered all the way down in terms of how you, not just how you think, how you live. If I'm walking on the edge of a cliff and it's like, wow, there's the fall off right there. It's, it's, a long, it's a long drop. It's wisdom that enables you to say, hey, man, I'm not just on a broad sidewalk here. I'm on a cliff. Wisdom helps you walk that path so you don't fall off. Wisdom is meeting the world and finding out how you fit it. Going out into the world, seeing how it works, and finding out how I meet it in a way that fix. Fool foolishness, on the other hand, foolishness according to scripture is taking my world, my experience, my inner life, and saying, how do I make the rest of the world fit that? That's biblical foolishness. Biblical wisdom is saying, what's given, and how do I meet it in a way that fits? I'm starting this way because in the scriptures that we just read, and the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and the Apostle John's resurrection account, he starts with the universal. He starts with the truth. He starts with the facts. But then he very beautifully has a meeting between those facts, the truth about what happened that morning, with a personal encounter that is really, really striking. So those are just the two headings I'm going to give you this morning, and I hope it's clear. I don't hope, first of all, that it moves you, although that's the Holy Spirit's always doing that in wonderful ways. I hope it's clear. And I hope there's at least an opening for you to respond to it through that clarity. And so you can hope, you can pray. You can take a moment and pray that that will be clear now. First, the truth. Secondly, our response. First, the truth. I open by saying something new happened to the world on that first Easter morning. This is what Christians believe. This is the testimony of the scriptures. There are actually many things in this passage that are, that are intended to hearken back to the very first pages of scripture in Genesis 1 and 2 that spoke about the creation of all things in a way that helps us understand Easter as a new creation. Easter is a new creation, and we're meant to understand that by looking back to some things about the first day of creation. Here's what I mean. Let me draw some things, particularly out of those first 11 verses that I just read from the Gospel of John chapter 20. First, we're told that it was dawn on the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. This heightens the sense of new beginning, right? First day. What is the command that comes on the first day from the mouth of God? Let there be light. The scene is light dawning. That was the first day. This is the first day of the week. 
The sense of a new day, a new creation day, is there from verse 1. Secondly, the scene is a garden. We know that because Mary turns around and she sees Jesus. She doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. First day, at new light, in a garden, and there's a male and a female there, like at the first garden. Actually, Mary, before she's ever called Mary by Jesus, and we'll get to that in a second, she's called twice just by the name woman. So there's a female who's just called woman, and there's a male who's just called gardener. That's it. First day of the week, new light in a garden, female and a male gardener. This is a picture of creation. John's orchestrating it in just that way to say that was the first beginning. This is a new beginning. And there's a lot there when it says Mary thought he was a gardener. St. Augustine, um, end of the 4th, early 5th century, in his commentaries is one of the early church fathers to emphasize this, that Jesus, it's not just that she mistakes him for the gardener. He really is the gardener. He is sowing things, Augustine says, throughout the conversation. He's sowing in her heart seeds of faith as he speaks to her. Again, we'll come back to that in a moment. There's also echoes here, though, of what went wrong in that first garden scene. This is a garden of tears. Mary is weeping. This is a garden where God comes to find humanity when they need someone to come and find them. But suddenly, all of a sudden, it becomes also a garden of communion. With one word to Mary, her name, Mary. It's like the world is born anew. What transpired in this garden, the Apostle John is trying to draw out, what transpired in this garden impacts the entire race of humanity just like in the other garden. This is the first day of the week, but really it's the first day of new creation. So what do we make of all this? What's the point? Why is John painting this picture for us? Let me explain it this way. The very first words of Scripture are, In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. But elsewhere in Scripture, I'm thinking Psalm 19. I'm thinking in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1. Other places in Scripture, we're led to believe that we actually don't need the words God created written down. In our hearts, we know it already. It's like this gardener has sowed truths in our hearts, and no one's left out of this, this gardener has sowed something in our hearts and there is no human heart left behind in this sowing. And depending on how that seed is cared for, this is a seed that recognizes in all things the hand of God. On some level, maybe it's buried, for all I know it's, it's there in the other 90% of our brains. But Every person on some level says not an accident. Or talk about wisdom now. Whatever's in the brain, we don't live. We do not live like this creation is an accident. And in some ways, the more we learn, the more confident we can be. Not that it always leads to professed faith. I mean, I'm thinking of like the impossibility. The impossibility of a single strand of DNA. We're not accidents. The seed's there. Scripture says, the apostle says, David says, Moses says, Paul says. The seed is there. And depending on how that seed is cared for, it thrives or it's throttled. But it never utterly goes away. And the scriptures would say to you, and I would say to you, for the love of God, for the love of God, let it live. Recognize it. Invite him to nurture it. The scriptures also speak to the universal recognition that while all things were created, just as clearly we can say, things are not as they were created to be. We say things like, it's not fair, like there's somebody there 
who should be weighing it. And I'm not just talking about in the court system. I'm not just talking about interpersonal relationships. I'm talking about sickness. I'm talking about accidents. I'm talking about where you were born. You didn't choose to be. Nobody in this room chose to be born. It's not fair. We cry like there's somebody who can hear. Things are not the way they ought to be, and we know it because of that seed that the gardener put there. But even that awareness testifies that there's a way things should be. And what we are reading about in John chapter 20 is we are reading about the Creator returning to tend the garden of His creation to return things to what they should be. The Apostle Paul gives a great illustration of what happens between Good Friday in, uh, all the way through Saturday and into Sunday morning. Using this gardener, now stay with me now, this is, this is not just a one-off, something Mary says in the garden. The Apostle Paul uses this in his chapter about resurrection. If there's one chapter in your New Testament um, outside of the Gospels that can really help you understand the significance of the resurrection, it is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he uses the garden illustration there. The Apostle Paul says, uh, in this supreme act of love where Jesus Christ took on flesh joined humanity in our sinful mess that we've made, forgave us and atoned for our sins on the cross, gave his life to break the curse of death, all that. The Apostle Paul says, think of it all this way. Essentially, Christ the gardener sowed his life into the ground. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Jesus Christ essentially sowed his life into the ground in what was grown up, what came out, was eternal, victorious, indestructible new life that he can now offer to you and me. The first heralds of the gospel who actually saw and touched Jesus in the flesh proclaimed this, death and resurrection of the Son of God, as universal good news for kings and slaves, old and young, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, even as they were all put to the sword, not all of them, but in a way that didn't discriminate between aristocracy and the plebes. We're put to the sword for the ways it upended the order of the Roman Empire. This is the universal message of, e of Easter. And I think, according to Scripture, I'm speaking to a seed that's already there. And so you you'll forgive me if I don't feel the need to have to be like, persuasive to the utmost, which is outside of my capability. I'm speaking to the seed now. Maybe it's in you. Maybe you recognize it now. God is. Sin kills. But life wins because Christ died and rose. C.S. Lewis said, I, I, just, I find this so beautiful. He said this about the seed in his own heart because he spent um, the first extended period of his life as an atheist. And then became one of our more influential Christian writers of the 20th century. He said, I believe the message of the gospel the way that I believe in the sun. It's not just that I can see the sun as our star in our solar system. But by the sun, I see everything else. By this gospel, I see everything else everything that I intellectually perceive, everything at a heart level I long for, everything that wisdom tells me, whether or not my philosophy, and it didn't line up with it for the first 30-some years of his life, whether or not my philosophy lines up with it, by wisdom I walk this way, just like the sun shines light on everything and I can see it. This gospel helps me see everything else. And meanwhile, we keep living. We decide Will we or will we not live as though this is true? With every decision that we make, make, with every breath, with every bite, with every covenant, with every relationship, with every sunrise, will we or will we not live like life wins, like there's a Lord, like there's a God that I will face? Will we or will we not align ourselves with this wisdom which is salvation, will remain in spiritual death now and in eternity. That's the Easter news. 
That's the truth, as Christians have proclaimed it. How do you receive it personally? That's the second point. Jesus says to Mary in verse 13, before, before she recognizes him, Jesus says, woman, why are you weeping? One of the things you need to know about Jesus Christ and when he asks questions, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He's Jesus Christ. When he asks a question, like he asks to Bartimaeus on the side of the road, the blind man, Mark 10, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus knows that he's blind. <laughs> Woman, why are you weeping? He doesn't need the information. He's not asking because he doesn't know the answer. It's never about information when Jesus asks a question. Well, then why does he ask? Is he playing games? He's not playing games. He's doing something terribly important, and it's about personal response. He's not asking for information. He's asking for access. Access. You know, you go to the doctor's office. You don't go to the doctor's office and um, enter the room. Doctor comes in. He just starts grabbing you and <laughs> doing stuff to you. But it's like, can you roll up your sleeve, please, so I can take your blood pressure or give you the shot? He's asking for access. This question is about Mary giving Christ access into an area of her life where he can begin to move. The God of the cosmos asks for an invitation to come before your heart. Have you ever been around a scared child? Um, I believe it was Trevor Hudson who put, the, put it this way to me the first time. Or not personally, but in something I heard him say. He said, imagine uh, you know a scared child. A lot of you don't have to imagine. Um, maybe a child is at the doctor and about to get a shot. And uh, they might say, mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, or whatever. I'm scared. I'm scared. You don't say to them, I know you're scared. Stupid comment. No. No. I'm their father. I know. I know my kids are scared. They don't have to tell me. But it's right that they do. Because it's not about information. They're giving me access to their lives so that my love for them can enter in. And because of this, unmistakably, and you know this, because you do these things in relationships, because you give access things can happen that otherwise can't happen. Like a relationship is formed. Like a relationship of trust is formed. And the relationship begins to follow a different trajectory into the future. Most of us here are not kids. But Jesus always asks that we relate to him and the Father that way. just wants access to bless you. The problem is for grown-ups, we're not very good at listening to our own pain or our own needs or the many things that wisdom tells us that we live according to, and yet we're incredibly good at living in alternate realities. This might be why we're an addictive society. Go shopping, work harder, have another drink. As wonderful as some of those things can be, we live there. We live for those things. Or perhaps we just get very angry. Into all this, Jesus says, what is happening in your life? And how can I, the one that all the facts talk about, that affect the cosmos, how can I meet you where you are? This is not a rhetorical question to Mary. It's not a rhetorical question. Why are you weeping? He is listening her into speaking. He would listen you into speaking. Will you answer that question? What stops you? Is Jesus strong enough to enter into the despair of your situation 
our environment right now around the world, the homicide rate in this city, in your personal relational pain? Do we have any expectation that hope will come back to us when we say to the God who we know on some level is there, help me, and begin maybe for the first time to relate to him? Can we even say the, Lord, the words, Lord, have mercy, before it's too late? It's after she acknowledges where she is. They've taken my Lord away that Jesus meets her. He says her name, Mary. The one through whom all things were made knows your name. Mary. He knows the mysteries of the farthest galaxies. And he knows your name. And it's like the world is born anew. So there's the facts. There's the personal response. Let me end like this, by going back to the universal. It's really interesting if you remember, Jesus says in verse 17, right at the end, in the last two verses, he says to Mary, don't hold on to me, don't cling to me. It's kind of like a weird thing. Apparently, I mean, I'm sure she's like at his feet, holding on to his, his feet, saying, Lord, you're not dead. There is life beyond the grave. I believed, and that belief is vindicated. Here you are. Everything is different now. And Jesus says, don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. Why? Well, he doesn't just say, don't cling to me. He says, don't cling to me, but go tell everyone else. Tell everyone else. He says, don't cling to me. I've not ascended to my Father yet. See, this very interesting thing happens when Jesus ascends 40 days after the resurrection. He ascends... Because it's once he's ascended that he then does what he promised he would do. He sends the Holy Spirit. If this is new to you, what happens through redemption history, as it's given to us in the scriptures, is after Jesus ascends, he sends the Holy Spirit of God on everyone who belongs to him, to everyone who clings to him by faith. And what happens when that happens, when the Holy Spirit enters in your life, because you're that forgiven, you're that clean, you're that cleansed by the forgiveness that Jesus offers, that God himself can dwell in and with you. So what we have now is not Jesus in one place, in one garden, in Palestine, but everywhere among the untold millions now, and billions throughout history up to this point, who have professed faith in Jesus are walking around with the power of God, not just one man in one place, in one garden, but spirit-filled people who are everywhere, all around the world, to the extent that the scriptures refer to us as Jesus' own body. This is a better body, Jesus says, for the world to have than his pre-ascension body. And this truth because Mary doesn't cling to him, because he does ascend, because she becomes, as she's known throughout church history, as the apostle to the apostles. Mary Magdalene is the one who tells the apostles, and the apostles then go with Mary to tell the rest of the world. world. It's because of that that this truth that we this morning have the option of making personal, this truth can come home to any nation any language, any story, any set of terrible decisions that a human being has, this news can invade their life and change them by the power of God today. That's Easter. That's what Easter kicked off. A word, a word for you if you're not a Christian, and then a word for you if you are. If you're not a Christian, I shared a little bit about this on Good Friday. I mean, you got to blur the lines. You don't think about Good Friday completely apart from Easter Sunday. But you don't think about Easter Sunday apart from Good Friday. I want you to know 
whatever you've done in your life, in terms of meaning making, in terms of behavior, in terms of sin, in terms of whatever, is on your conscience or in your journal. He can forgive anything, totally, completely, once and for all. But the invitation is, he doesn't enter in as Savior unless he enters in as Lord. This Jesus saves you, forgiving you of all your sins in order to bring you back to God's purpose for your life. And that is worship. You exist not to align this world with what you want, but to meet reality as he's created it to be. And fit it. There's a fit in the human heart to God's intention for all things. And you're a part of it. And many people in this room have said, it's like I was waiting to hear all my life that I was for something beyond myself. That's for you. If you're a Christian, I just want to remind you of something. If you've believed that news a long time ago, before now. When you come to Christ, that powerful Holy Spirit that was there at the beginning, that he sent on Pentecost, when you believe in Christ and receive his forgiveness, when you let him in, that power that was involved in raising Christ from the dead comes into your life and begins to work in you now. That's part of what you need to know as you seek to live as an Easter person today. And when we come to this table, we're actually professing that. We're saying, Lord, week by week we do this, if you're new to, to, to liberty. We don't do this just on Easter. We receive communion every week. And what we're doing when we come to receive it is we're saying, Lord, amazingly, I've forgotten this news again. Unfathomably, I've lived again aside from that truth. I've tried to make the world fit me instead of me looking to fit you. But here I am again, and here, here you are with your arms outstretched, just like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, just ready to receive. I mean, that kid did everything wrong, everything wrong. And the father's just right there waiting, waiting for him to come back. But you gotta come back. That's what the table's for. I mean, it might have been last Monday, right after you received communion on Sunday. You went as far as, you, as you've ever gone before. This table is not about you being good. It's about him being merciful. You've got to come back. And also be strengthened by his power to go out and live out that resurrection life that's alive in you by the Holy Spirit. That's Easter. And Pentecost. <laughs> And Good Friday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.